One stormy winter day, a flight left out of Washington, D.C. with 79 people. Seconds after takeoff, the plane crashed into the 14th Street Bridge and into the icy Potomac. Immediately after the crash, the surviving six passengers held to a piece of the plane, trying to stay afloat in the icy water. Coast Guard helicopters came to the rescue for these six survivors and they lowered a life ring and one surviving man caught the life ring and five times handed the life ring to the other crash survivors in the icy water. All five were rescued. When the helicopter returned for a final trip to rescue the sixth and final man, the man disappeared beneath the water. The survivors at that time didn't even know his name. This unknown man gave his life so they might live. Eventually, the repaired 14th Street Bridge was renamed to honor this mystery hero, Arland D. Williams. The author of Hebrews wants us to know there is no mystery hero. His name is Jesus Christ. He is not a mystery. His name is Jesus Christ, Christ the Messiah, Christ the one who takes away the sin of the world. And the author of Hebrews wants us to know there's no mystery about how and why this was done. It was always about the shedding of blood the blood is our life ring. But for the redemption of mankind, only one blood source would count. And that's the blood of God himself, Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews wants us to know, though Jesus may be this unknown hero to you, you are not unknown to God. Jesus knew you before you were born. He was thinking of you and me when he died to redeem you and me. So will you please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 and please pray with me. Lord, we long to know more about you as our perfect sacrifice, what it means for us today, what it means for eternity. Reveal your truths in scripture to us. In your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So it is in this great name we profess and we we study and we try to understand what Jesus Christ is doing. Back in chapter 8, we learn Jesus is the guarantor of a better co covenant. He is the seal on that better covenant. Hebrews chapter 9 says, so, so now what? The old covenant is gone. So are the old ordinances, the shedding of animal blood for atonement. So now what do we do? Well, Jesus' blood is the only blood that counts, and the only way you can receive that is knowing it. So there was at one moment in time, 33 AD, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hung on the cross, shedding his blood for a once and forever forgiveness for everyone. So let's put ourselves, though, in 68 AD as Hebrews is being first read. And in your mind, look over to the temple. What do you see? You're going to see what the priests have been doing since the days of Moses, shedding animal blood for the sin of humans. And so for the non-Christian Jews, nothing about that incredible day in 33 AD when the once and forever sacrifice shed his blood on the cross, nothing about that day changed anything for them. They still woke up every day guilt-ridden, sin-ridden, conscious-stricken, and hell-bet to justify themselves before God by having someone kill animals on their behalf. But that is really no different for people today, isn't it? People who don't believe in Jesus Christ, death and resurrection. There's no difference. Nothing we can do can clean our conscience. We try to do good works. We might tithe a little or do God a solid by showing up for church on Christmas Eve. Or perhaps people deny our, our conscience altogether by denying God as the author of the universe, the author who has authority over whether or not you take one more breath in this lifetime. 
So chapter nine of Hebrews, it makes us confront this significant truth. The Jesus event in 33 AD changed everything for everybody. And the question is, will you let it change you? Or will you keep doing what you've always done? Chapter 9 has uh, two nice divisions. The first is uh, through 1 through verse 10 is uh, ta the tabernacle, the first covenant. And then after chapter verse 11 through 28, it really gets back to Jesus Christ as being the center. And there's a verse in each of these sections that highlights this comparison. Verse 6 says the priests always went into the first tabernacle to accomplish the service of God. You compare that in verse 11, but now... In verse 11, Jesus came as the high priest of the good things to come. Jesus went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle. The contrast, something significant altered history of mankind forever. Now let me illustrate this. In December 2017, the company I worked for for 10 years was bought by another company. What if I refused to live into this new reality? I would show up at the old vacant building. I would try to do business in an empty warehouse with non-existent customers with nothing to offer them. I'd never get paid because I don't recognize a, a check from the new company as I'm waiting for a paycheck from my old company, the non-existent company with no bank account. You see, this is the situation for everyone who doesn't believe in the reality of Jesus, the Son of God, in 33 AD, dying a sacrificial death on the cross. You can't live your own truth. There was a moment in history, the road changed. 2,000 years ago, the road changed direction forever. If you don't believe God intersected humanity you're deceiving yourself by living a lie. Every day, cashing fake checks. This is what the author of Hebrews chapter 9 is getting at. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. And then you can read on. He begins a tour of the beautiful, breathtaking, ornate tabernacle. And he even pulls back the curtain to the most holy place, a place that no one had ever seen except for the high priest who gets to go once a year, once a year on the Day of Atonement. But then the author says, well, we can't discuss these things in detail now. That has to make you and me as Bible students laugh because as a Bible student, we know there are endless details describing the various tabernacles and temples throughout Israel's history. They are very, very excited about the detail God provided for them. And, and the author says, I could go on and on, but, but I need to make a point. And we like that, don't we? He, chapter 9, verse 6, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. To accomplish the service of God, this was the only way you could approach God was through the offerings of the priests. Every day, people came lined up seeking forgiveness, needing a cleanse cleansed conscious or wanting to thank God and on their arms they brought their goat to the priest and then the priest killed that goat or animal or whatever the sacrifice was on behalf of the person. An endless line, an endless tax, tasks. You can see it's wildly imperfect but it was God's way at that time and, and it clearly foreshadows the one who would come and say no one comes to the Father but by me. That's in uh, chapter or John chapter 14. So in verse 8, it says, The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. A couple of notes about this. First, I love when God the Holy Spirit is revealed in Scripture. It, it helps us to stand in awe of the infinite trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we learn here the Holy Spirit directed the tabernacle's sacrificial rhythm. It was through this the Holy Spirit taught us great truths of God and then kept these truths among, uh, alert in our minds. The better Greek translation of this verse is it is the way uh, of, of the first had not been disclosed while the first tabernacle stood. And, and what that means is the reality of 
today cannot be grasped if we're trying to reach backward and grasp at shadows. I can't keep reaching back to a job with a company that no longer exists. We can't keep reaching back to old patterns. Jesus Christ intersected the road of humanity and changed reality for mankind. At one moment in history, the old is gone forever. Let's read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Now, now the author cuts to the heart, the heart of you and me, this is desire for a clean, clean conscience. The old ways, they proved ineffective. There was always a barrier between people and God. Their conscience never found relief and personal uncleanness always haunted them. Gifts and sacrifices would not remove sin. Nothing purified the soul. Nothing removed the stains of guilt. Nothing brought peace. God had ordained one way. Only one blood type could do that, not one million animals. Nothing but the blood of the Redeemer. So do you struggle with your conscience? Is your heart at rest or is your heart in turmoil? Do you struggle for peace? Or if you're clinging, clinging to the shadows of the past, of, of past rituals, of being good enough, of uh, the faith of your parents, if you're clinging to any of that, you have found yourself on a road, traveling down a road that was torn down 2,000 years ago. That is not reality. And I want to warn you, your destiny is at stake. That is what the Bible says. You are drifting into apostasy. You're abandoning God's ways and God's instruction and, and God's clear words for your own ways and your own understanding. And you will never find heart peace if you're trying to please God through good behavior. They'll just drive yourself into hopeless despair. Jesus Christ intersected humanity and lit a better way for us, the way to the presence of God. So walk into that reality. The Holy Spirit is illuminating this reality for you. And full forgiveness of sins and untainted intimacy with God is, is the path that God has designed for you. It's a, a heart of peace with clear conscience because of Christ's redeeming one-time work on the cross. So will you trust this is God's invitation? He's designed, he's invited you to live into this today. So now the chapter once again puts this full spotlight on Jesus Christ, the perfect high priest of a perfect tabernacle. In verse 11, when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, that is not part of this creation. And the author is saying, if God accepted animal sacrifices as the pattern for forgiveness of sins for all of those since the time of Moses, in verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we might serve the living God? Again, we see the Trinity here. The Trinity seals the deal. This is our relationship with God. It has been restored. This is mind body and soul healing sealed by the Trinity, the three persons of God. We can never clean our conscience of the ugliness we do toward God and towards God's creation and toward God's people. And God knew this. And God lovingly determined by the Holy Spirit to offer Jesus, God the Son. Jesus was offered in our place. And now God's justice is satisfied. And more so, we are freed to set aside useless rituals and worry of being enough. We set that aside and that frees us to, learn, to serve the living God. This is reality. In your hard situation today, how might your freedom to serve God look? In verse 15, it, it now begins to move us in an interesting direction. It's Christ Jesus' last will and testament. In verse 15, it says, 
for this reason. Well, what reason? Well, it's for the reason that we may serve the living God. So for this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, the, the new covenant that is given so those might receive the promised inheritance. So Christ is the will maker and he, he, he's the one who dies, but he's also the executor administrating the estate. So Christ administers the new covenant to those who are called and then he equips them to serve the living God. We've inherited a fortune, haven't we? We've been given a perfect father-child relationship with God. We've been invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. So are you coming to God as his beloved child? Are you bringing your joys and hopes? Are you bringing your basket of burdens? Are you bringing your bag of confusion and pain? I've been struggling with a, a situation, pleading with God to help me not sin as I walk through the cycle of anger and frustration and sadness that this situation has caused me. And that is our inheritance. We come to the living God as our great compassionate father. We come with our sin and our pain knowing God the father scoops us up as his child. And this is our hope. This is our only hope. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Despite the mess inside your soul and inside your life, inside and outside, Jesus perfectly removed every spot and every wrinkle from us. Jesus Christ did this. Jesus God the Son did this. Jesus did this so we can be scooped up by the Holy of Holies, God. And verse 22 says it so clearly, no other way. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Sin rooted in our hearts alienates us from God's presence, alienates us from the journey that he wants us to walk on with him. Sin cannot be removed by a self-help program and no other religion has any viable help to offer for a removal of sin. Sin is a radical and terrible reality that calls out for a radical and terrible cure. And this happens by one radical rescuer with one specific blood type, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus' death and resurrection removed sin through death, and it prov provides a new intimacy with God through his resurrection that makes service to God our delight. In the last section, he says over and over and over, once and for all, once and for all. In verse 27, just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to all who are waiting for him. So much amazing truth in that, but for all who trust Jesus Christ, Judgment has been removed forever by Christ. Your judgment has been removed forever when you are a believer. Instead, when Jesus returns, he will bring salvation to us, meaning every believer receives this eternal transformed body. The bottom line of chapter 9 is there are two places for your sin. It's either on you or on Christ. And if you have not accepted the sacrifice of Christ, if you didn't trust him as your redeemer, there is nothing ahead of you but the judgment of God. And no one who appears at that judgment will be saved at that time. Everyone will be given a fair chance to present their works and they will discover that God was right all along. One offer, God's offer was made perfect in Christ. So today, if your sin is still on you, you can do nothing to remove it, but believe the life, death, and resurrection of God the Son, Jesus Christ. So here's what I pray you believe. There are two places for your sin, either on you or on Christ. What are you going to do? Two places for your sin, either on you or on Christ. Will you trust Jesus Christ who died for your sin once and for all? Please pray. Mighty God, it is amazing to think all you ask is our belief. You don't ask us to keep carrying 
sacrifices to make things right. You ask us to say what made things right was Jesus Christ. And so I, I plead with you that every one of us believes deep in our hearts that you are the only one that can make anything right. That means you are our only rescuer and help us to, to cast our full life on that, to receive the life ring of, of salvation in you, Jesus Christ, by your one great act, your life, your death, your resurrection that guarantees our eternity with our heavenly and holy Father. In your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.